Hi everybody, my name is Alok. I'm a second year PhD student at UC Berkeley, advised by Kathy Yellick and Aiden Bilic. And I'll be talking about how to reduce communication in graph neural network training. So why are we focusing on graphs at all? Well, the truth is graphs are ubiquitous nowadays. We have very natural graph representations like social networks, where each node is a person, and an edge between two people represents if those two people are friends. We also have molecular graphs like in COVID-19 drug design, where atoms are nodes, and an edge between two atoms represents if those two atoms have a chemical bond between them. And even in proteomics, we have giant protein-protein interaction networks, where a node is a protein, and an edge between two proteins represents if those two proteins have some sort of a biological interaction between them. And with the ubiquity of graphs comes the ubiquity of machine learning problems on graphs. We have problems like graph classification, where we're given a set of graphs, and for each graph, we want to classify that graph into one of a few categories. We also have edge classification, where we're given a graph, and for each edge in the graph, we want to classify each edge. And likewise, we have node classification, where we're given a graph, and we want to classify each node in this graph. And this has applications in social networks, where we might want to classify each user into one of a few types. And in this work and in this talk, I'll mostly focus on node classification, but everything that we talk about can be applied to both graph and edge classification as well. And so we've established that there are a lot of deep learning problems on graphs, but we already have deep learning architectures out there. Why not use something like a CNN except on graph data? Well, the truth is CNNs are specialized for images and images are essentially a special case of graphs. We can think of images as a special case of graphs by thinking of each pixel in an image as a node. And with this formulation, we know that nearly all nodes in this graph have exactly eight neighbors. And this makes the notion of a convolution on an image relatively simple. But graphs are not as well structured as images. Nodes can have arbitrary neighborhoods of variable size. And so we need to generalize the notion of a convolution to work on arbitrary neighborhoods. And to do this, we need to use a new architecture. And to solve deep learning problems on graphs, the architecture we use is what's known as a graph neural network. And a graph neural network, a GNN, essentially takes two things as input. It takes the input graph, and it also takes a feature vector per node in the graph, because recall we're working on node classification here. And in a GNN, we essentially have multiple layers where each layer has a set of all the vertices in the input graph. So for instance, here with the GNN on the right with the input graph on the left, we see that we have three layers where each layer has all four vertices in the original graph. And on top of these vertices, we have edges between vertices between layers if those edges exist in the original graph as well. So if we look at vertex one, for instance, vertex one in the GNN has an edge from zero to one, from one to one, and from two to one, because in the original graph, edges 0 to 1 and 2 to 1 exist. And we also have that self loop from 1 to 1. And the reason we construct the GNN this way is the core operation of GNN training is take each vertex in the graph and for each vertex, sum over the feature vectors across that vertex's incoming neighbors. And this is much easier to do with the GNN construction on the right. Because for instance, if we want to do this operation on vertex 1, we can take vertex 1 and simply iterate over all of its incoming neighbors, 0, 1, and 2, and sum over the feature vectors across all of these incoming neighbors. And if we want to repeat this operation, we can just go over to the next layer in the graph neural network and do the same exact thing. And so just to flesh out the details of forward propagation in graph neural network training, we essentially have three steps. We first want to initialize the feature vectors in layer 0 of the network. This is basically giving us the input feature vectors to the GNN. And then after that, we do this core operation like before. We take each vertex and sum over the feature vectors over each vertex's incoming neighbors. And after we apply this core operation, we also apply weights to these vector sums. And these are the weights that the neural network actually learns in back propagation. But there's an issue here, and it's a big issue. And the issue is that GNN models tend to be very large, even for medium-sized graphs. And the reason this is, is that we have to store the feature vector per node in the graph, per layer in the graph neural network, because we need to store these feature vectors for backpropagation. This means that if n is the number of vertices in our graph, f is the length of our feature vector, and l is the number of layers, then the GNN model takes n times f times l space. 
And just to get a little bit of context here, N is typically in the millions, even for medium-sized graphs. F is the length of feature vector, and that tends to be on the order of a few hundred. And L, the number of layers, is typically about two or three. But multiplied together, and this is too big to fit on one device. And so we need to distribute GNN training and GNN inference for medium and large size graphs. But this isn't an issue that we haven't seen before. For CNNs and for distributed deep learning that we've done before, we typically use mini batch stochastic gradient descent to distribute training on multiple devices. Why don't we do this for GNNs? Well, this works well for things like images, where if we have a large set of images that we want to train on, we can simply subset sets of images and assign different subsets to different devices and run training in a distributed fashion that way. But for graphs, there's an extra step because of the core operation of graph neural network training, where we take each vertex and sum over all of its neighbors feature vectors. If we take a subset of vertices, we can't just store that subset of vertices on the device because we need the neighbors for those vertices because of that core operation of graph neural network training. And if we have an extra layer in the GNN, then now we need the neighbors of the neighbors of those initial subset of vertices. And these dependencies explode exponentially, so we're not actually saving on a lot of space by subsetting, by sampling subsets of vertices. And so in this work, we primarily focus on full batch gradient descent, where we first distribute the entire model across multiple devices, and then process every edge and every vertex per epoch, only communicating the necessary information. And so how do we ourselves approach distributed GNN training? Well, we essentially do two things. We first formulate GNN training as a series of sparse times dense matrix multiplication operations for both forward and backward propagation. And after we've come up with this formulation, we leverage sparse times dense distributed matrix multiplication algorithms to distribute GNN training across multiple devices. And recall, we focus primarily on node classification here, but everything that we talk about can be applied to both graph and edge classification as well. And so before we can actually use distributed sparse times dense matrix multiplication algorithms, we need to formulate GNN training as a series of sparse times dense matrix multiplications. And when we do that, we essentially get four distinct operations, two for forward propagation and two for backward propagation. I'll leave the derivations for backprop for the paper, but the forward propagation operations follow our intuition for GNN training. And we can see this by honing in on the first equation, on the first forward propagation operation. A is the adjacency matrix for the graph. It's stored in a sparse format, and I'll note that every other matrix other than A is stored in a dense format. And H is the dense embedding matrix, meaning it has the feature vector for each node in the graph for a particular layer L minus one. And just by multiplying A transpose and H, we resemble that core operation of graph neural network training, where we take each vertex in the graph and sum over that vertex's incoming neighbors feature vectors. And just by multiplying with another small weight matrix W for layer L, we're, multiple, we're applying weights to the vector sums that we computed with A transpose times H. And so this first forward propagation operation resembles the GNN intuition that we had seen earlier. I'll leave the, the way we distribute the second forward propagation operation for the paper because it's not as expensive as this matrix multiplication from before. And so we can see that we can formulate all of GNN training as this series of matrix multiplication operations. But when we take a deeper look, we see that we're not actually using a diverse set of matrix operations. We really only use SPMMs and DGEMs. We can see this by looking over each operation here, where for the first forward propagation operation, we have one SPMM that multiplies A transpose, a large sparse, sparse matrix, with H, which is a dense tall skinny matrix. And then we have one DGEM that multiplies the result of A transpose times H with this small dense weight matrix W. Again, I'll leave the second operation for the paper but even in back propagation, we can see that the first operation we do is very similar to the first operation from forward propagation. We have an SPMM that multiplies A with G for layer L, where G is another tall, skinny, dense matrix. And then we also have a DGEM that multiplies the result of A times G with a small, dense weight matrix WL transpose. And even for the last 
backward propagation operation. We have a single DGEM that multiplies our dense embedding, embedding matrix A H L minus one transpose with this dense A times G output that we already computed from the first back propagation operation. So we see that all of GNN training can be expressed entirely with SPMM and DGEM calls. But we're not actually using each of these operations equally. In fact, we spend a lot more time on SPMM than DGEM. And we can see this by again honing in on the first forward propagation operation, where this cartoon sort of illustrates the matrix sizes that we're dealing with with this first forward propagation operation. The SPMM again is multiplying our large but sparse A transpose matrix with this tall, skinny, dense embedding matrix HL minus 1. And the DGEM is just multiplying the result of A transpose times H with this small F by F weight matrix W sub L. And so we can see that between SPMM and DGEM, SPMM has way more work to do. It's multiplying two much larger matrices than the DGEM operation, which means that SPMM takes way more time than DGEM in the context of graph neural network training. And the result of this is that SPMM, the sparse time sense matrix multiplication, is the bottleneck of graph neural network training when we formulate it as a series of matrix multiplication operations. And so now that we know that SPMM is our bottleneck here, we can leverage distributed SPMM algorithms, distributed sparse time sense matrix multiplication algorithms, to distribute GNN training across multiple devices. So we'll talk a little bit about how distributed matrix multiplication works in general, just to give some context about how we distribute SPMM. And so if we're trying to compute A times B equals C, where A and B are matrices, we can represent this computation as the cube on the left, this computation cube, where each face of the cube represents a matrix A, B, or C, and each point within the cube is a single multiplication that we're trying to do. And we can distribute this a times b equals c multiplication by partitioning the cube into different ways. For instance, if we partition the cube into slabs, where every multiplication in a slab happens on a single processor, we get what's known as a 1D algorithm. Likewise, if we partition the cube into prisms, where each multiplication in a prism happens on a single processor, we get what's known as 2D algorithms. And by the same token, if we partition the cube into smaller cubes, we get what's known as a 3D algorithm. And in our work, we apply each of these three types of algorithms, 1D, 2D, and 3D, to the context of GNN training. We also evaluated GNN training with what's known as a 1.5D algorithm, which exists on the spectrum between 1D and 2D algorithms. And these 1.5D algorithms replicate both input matrices by a factor of C. But replication is okay since we increase the amount of total memory available as we increase the number of devices that we use. And so these algorithms have been studied independently before, but they haven't been studied in the context of GNN training. And so we also did a communication analysis to see how GNN training should perform in theory using these distributed matrix multiplication algorithms. And what we saw was a spectrum of trade-offs between constant factors and scaling factors, especially if we focus on the bandwidth term. For instance, if we look at our 1D algorithm, we see that there is no scaling factor, that is, we don't reduce the communication time even if we increase the number of devices, but the 1D algorithm does have low constant factors. And when we go down the table to our 1.5D algorithm, we see that we have slightly higher constant factors, but now our bandwidth scales by both a factor of C and a factor of P over C, where again, C is the replication factor since we replicate both input matrices by a factor of C in our 1.5D algorithm. And when we go down to our 2D algorithm, the constant factors go up, but now we scale by a factor of square root of P for the entire bandwidth. And when we go down to our 3D algorithm, the constant factors go up again, but now we scale by a factor of P to the two thirds instead of square root of P. One other trade-off I'll note is that all of these algorithms use the same amount of memory except the 1.5D algorithm, where the 1.5D algorithm uses C times as much memory. Because recall for 1.5D, we replicate both input matrices by a factor of C, so our 1.5D algorithm uses C times as much memory 
But in practice, our results show that the 1.5D algorithm generally performs the best out of these four algorithms. And so I'll talk about how GNN training with these sparse times dense matrix multiplication algorithms fared in practice. But before that, I'll just give a little bit of context about how we performed our experiments. We used PyTorch 1.3 in our implementation with a nickel 2.0 background backend. And we also use PyTorch geometric here. And we focus on the Kipf-Welling model, which has three convolution layers and 16 activations in the hidden layer. We also run all of our experiments on the Summit supercomputer at OLCF, which has six V100s per node, NVLink 2.0 between the GPUs, and EDR InfiniBand between nodes. And we ran training on three different data sets, Amazon, Reddit, and Protein, where Reddit is our smallest data set with 114 million edges. Amazon is slightly larger with 231 million edges, but it's also our sparsest data set with about 25 non-zeros per row. And we also have Protein, which is our largest data set with 2 billion edges. And so for our one and a half D algorithm, like the theory suggested, we see scaling by both a factor of P and P over C. And just to explain the plot a little bit, we have a subplot for Amazon and a subplot for Protein, our two largest data sets that we evaluated on. And we plotted training in terms of amount of time taken per epoch. And we ran training on a series of increasing GPU counts. So for Amazon, we ran training on 16, 36, 64, and 100 GPUs. And likewise for Protein, we also ran training on increasing GPU counts. And so these plots show that we see scaling uh, for our one and a half D algorithm when we fix one GPU per node. The reason we fix one GPU per node has to deal with summit topology, and I'll leave that explanation to the paper, but we also include in the paper full six GPU per node results for a one and a half D algorithm as well. And on top of that, we see we expect to see better scaling with all GPUs per node used for future architectures like Perlmutter, the next generation after summit. And we also evaluated GNN training with 2D and 3D matrix multiplication algorithms as well. And we see here that uh, our communication scales with P consistent with the analysis that we had earlier, but our computation scales slightly less well. And the reason for this is explained in the paper as well. So overall, what did we talk about? We talked about how graphs are everywhere these days. And because graphs are everywhere, we have lots of deep learning and machine per learning problems on graphs everywhere as well. But to solve deep learning problems on graphs, we can't use CNNs or RNNs or previous architectures for deep learning. We need to use what's known as a graph neural network, a GNN. But the problem is GNN models tend to be very, very big. And so we need to distribute training across multiple GPUs and multiple devices. And so how do we distribute GNN training? We essentially go about it in two steps. We first formulate GNN training as a series of sparse dense matrix multiplications, and then we leverage sparse dense matrix multiplication algorithms in distributed settings to distribute GNN training across multiple devices. I have attached links to both our code and our archive paper, and this concludes this presentation, and I am available for questions.